puppets, bats, and I wasn't expecting so many people, so this is really awesome. And I'm going to mention it now because I might forget later, but I do have a whole bunch of Pippa stickers here, so try and grab one before you leave. I hope I've got enough for everyone, so you're all here first, so that's why I'm mentioning it now. So come and grab one of these at the end. So, did anyone see me yesterday running dressed as a bat? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Probably, um, yeah, a little batty. I'm not sure it's the smartest idea I've ever had, especially running around this bit here. But yes, I made it anyway. Um, does anyone know why I was dressed as a bat? Apart from being slightly crazy. Bad week. So the reason I was dressed as a bat is because today is 15 years since the extinction of the Christmas Island Pipistrelle. So I was actually dressed as a Pipistrelle bat. Very, very tiny bat. My partner always says I'm really small, so I think that's um, quite fitting. And um, the reason why I was dressed as that bat is because it's a really important part of the island's history. It's also a really important part of biodiversity. And the story of the Pipistrelle is a story that has lots of really important lessons, lessons that we can learn from, uh, lessons that can help us protect other species as well. So that's the reason why I was dressed as a bat, so people would start being like, why is this crazy lady, lady dressing as a bat? What's that all about? And hopefully get this kind of people talking a bit more about the Pipistrelle. So a lot of people can't actually remember the Pipistrelle, um, but it's a very uh, cute little bat that I'll show you picture of and talk about a little bit about in a moment. Uh, I was also doing the run to raise money for um, unstudied bat species and for nature conservation as well. There's a QR code on my back here, or I've got one down here, so if anyone did want to sponsor me, just let me know and I'll put, actually I'll put them out now because knowing me I'll forget. And um, yeah, any donations would be really appreciated uh, as well. Because you all know that I did it because most of you saw me running. <laughs> so and I've got lots of evidence of that. So anyway, I thought I would talk a little bit about the Christmas Island Pipistrelle, probably be talking for about 15 minutes, then we're going to head over to one of the camps for the Christmas Island Flying Fox. Annabelle's going to talk a little bit about the Flying Fox, and then we're going to head back here. Uh, but before we begin uh, talking about the Christmas Island Pipistrelle, I thought I'd talk a little bit about bats generally. Because unfortunately there's a lot of misinformation about bats, a bit of a negative perception about bats, and this has actually impacted their conservation and it's also had a bit of an impact on uh, the research uh, undertaken on bats as well. And really, it's only been in the last 30 to 40 years that a lot of our bat research has happened. So I thought I'd cover some of the basics and hopefully some of you will have a really, a few really cool bat facts to go away with at the end of the day. So to start with, bats are our only true flying mammal. They actually fly with their hands. If you have a look at your hand right now and you imagine you've got super long fingers and then in between each finger you've got some wing membrane and then between your pinky and your ankle you've got some more wing membrane. That is what makes up the wing of a bat. So bats literally fly with their hands, which is pretty cool. Not only that, but the membrane of a bat can actually repair itself really quickly. So if it gets torn, or if a couple of scientists like me and Annabelle go out and we take a couple of uh, wing punctures from the bat to get some DNA from it, that wing can actually repair itself within two weeks, which is really, really quick. And this has actually got some uh, medical researchers and scientists interested, We're starting to research this to see what else we can learn. And from uh, medical researchers studying bats elsewhere, so I'm going to use an example in South America, some uh, medical researchers started to study some bats over there and they've started to discover um, how they can create stroke medication, heart disease medication as well. So we're really beginning to learn a lot from our bats. Now bats are super diverse. Across the entire world we have over 1,450 different species of bats. That's about 20% of all mammal species. So there's a really huge number of bats. And they're, bat they're found on every continent across the world, except for Antarctica. And they're found in lots of different habitats. So as we know, they're found in jungle habitats, forest habitats. They're found in urban areas. They're found in desert habitats. They're even found on remote islands like Christmas Island. So really, really diverse. They also eat lots of different things. So our little pipistrelle, Christmas Island pipistrelle, used to eat lots of insects, insects like mosquitoes. Um, but other bats also eat things like 
are spiders. We've got some bats that eat fruit. We've got some bats that eat nectar. We've got some bats that eat frogs. We've got some bats that even eat other bats. So incredibly diverse um, uh, diet of bat. So what else is really cool about bats? Well, some species of bats. With... Oh, I'll take one. <laughs> so um, Lynn's just passing around a little Christmas Island pipistrelle. This is the actual size of the Christmas Island pipistrelle, so it gives you an idea how small it is. And I've also got here, just to give you an idea of perspective, uh, about the size of the Christmas Island fine fox. So I'll hand that around as well so you get an idea of how diverse bats can be. So I'll hand that around to you. And this picture is a Christmas Island pipistrelle as well, so you'll be able to actually see what they, they look like as well. I'll talk more about the Christmas Island pipistrelle in a moment. And so, what a lot of bats do, pretty much, actually every family except for our flying foxes and our fruit bat family, uh, and even then there's a couple of exceptions, but a lot of bats do something called echolocation. Does anyone know what echolocation is? Yes? Like, 
lots and lots of it in one place. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah, come up. You can, you can There's some trees on the floor down here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're spot on. <laughs> <laughs> What a bat roost is, it's where a bat hangs out during the day. They're really important for bats, and it's where a bat spends most of its time. There's lots of different types of roosts. We have maternity roosts, uh, we have mating roosts, we have lots of different types of roosts. But what we know is they're really, really important for bats. But yeah, spot on there, really good job. Uh, so what else about this Pippa's Strail can we say? Well, let's talk about the story of the Christmas Island um, Pippa's Strail. So back in... 1994, a lady of the name of Lindy Lumsden came to the island. Now she's a bat researcher based over in Victoria, and she came over on holiday to help out with some bird surveys. And while she's here, like most of us um, batty people, uh, she also did some bat surveys. So she brought with her a whole bunch of bat detectors. She also brought some heart traps, which is what we use to trap these little bats. And she did loads of surveys across the island. And this is where she found out that the the species was about 31% uh, less than what it was uh, in the 80s when the previous surveys took place. 31%, huge uh, decline, very, very quick decline as well. Lindy then spent the next 15 years of her life uh, lobbying, uh, researching, gathering help from other people to try and find out what was causing the decline of the Pipistrel. Then in 2009, in August 2009, they finally got permission to carry out a captive breeding program on the island. And Lindy came over to the island, uh, along with uh, some people from Fornatex, some people from uh, Zoos Victoria, a whole bunch of people from the Australasian Bat Society as well, and Parks Australia also helped with this um, kind of rescue attempt. And what they did is they went out to the last a hot spot of the pipistrel. And the idea was to capture the last pipistrels so they could set up this breeding program. But when they got to the island, they discovered only one individual bat left. They still attempted to capture this bat because they were hoping maybe if there might be another one. We don't know. Maybe there's more than one out there. Um, it's really hard to determine actual populations just based on recording. So who knows? We, we might get lucky. So they headed out to um, Winifred uh, Track. It's got the name for a second. I was only there today. <laughs> and um, they set up this really big mist net tunnel. So loads of different mist nets. They sewed together and they created a tunnel. And they put this tunnel in the flyway of where the bats fly. And they got out their detectors and they started to record the bat. And they could hear the bat flying up and down this trap. Unfortunately, it did not go into the mist net tunnel. And then suddenly the bat detector, so that it was chirping away, and then it went silent. And that was the last time the bat was ever recorded. They followed up with lots of other surveys after this, but they never recorded a bat again. Now that was 15 years ago today that that happened. And it's very unusual to actually know the date that a species went extinct, to actually witness species go extinct, but that's exactly what happened for Lindy and everyone else that was present there. It's a very unusual event. Now this story is a very sad story. It's one, it's very hard to talk about um, extinction because people don't often want to talk about these things, but there are a lot of really important lessons that we can learn from this. So it's really important to keep that memory alive. So some of the things that we can learn about, and I won't cover them all now, um, but what we do know is that species, even common widespread species, can go extinct, can decline very rapidly. And we know it's important to try and identify the cause of that decline as well, which in the case of the Pipistrel, even today, we don't know the actual cause of the decline. It's likely caused by lots of different factors, um, but the actual trigger is still largely unknown. What we do know is that invasive species are likely to have had a huge impact on the population. 
So species such as feral cats would have had an impact on the population. We know from studies elsewhere done on feral cats that um, they do predate on on, pipis, um, on small micro bats like the pipistrel. Uh, someone actually reported to me quite recently a cat that was trapped in uh, in WA had 14 little bats in the stomach of this one cat. It's a really huge number. Uh, bats. They don't re reproduce very quickly, and like a lot of rodent species, they often only have one, maybe two pups, and they care for them as well. So they don't replenish that population very quickly. So that could have a massive impact on the population. Uh, but for most researchers, the main kind of culprit, I guess, that led to the decline was the Asian wolf snake. Uh, the Asian wolf snake was introduced around the same time as the pipistrelle started to decline. And at the time, they didn't know that the Asian wolf snake could climb trees. Uh, it turned out later that they discovered that it could. And it's likely that uh, would have had a huge impact and could have even been like the trigger that was really the final nail with the box of that. So this is why I ran in a back box here. <laughs> it's like I said, talking about extinction is really difficult, but it's something that I don't want people to forget because I do think we have a lot to kind of learn from, um, and I've only just covered a couple of things here, but the more we can talk about these things, the more we can keep the memory alive. As I mentioned, it's an important part of the island's history, and it's also, yeah, something that we, we can certainly learn from. So I think now I might actually hand out these stickers, because otherwise I'll... Oh, oh no, you've already done that. Now. Okay, so Lynn has the paper strap stickers. Okay, great. So make sure you get a Christmas Island Pipistrelle sticker when you leave. It's the one that's on the back here. A friend of mine um, designed it for me for this run, so I chose to wear a bat suit instead. <laughs> but yeah, we do have some stickers. Uh, they're not outdoor stickers though, so just to warn you. Yeah, don't put them on your car. Um, if anyone do have any questions, then I could probably take a... Actually, should we head out to the... Okay, I'm going to be around here, so if you have any questions, feel free to come up to me and ask them, but we'll make our way over to the camp, which is just up that way, and Annabelle will talk a little bit about the Christmas Island Thanks, Kelly.